There was a strange silence in the room all of a sudden. Seeing that Nora hadn't said anything for a while, old Maddie thought that she had received a huge blow because of what he had just proclaimed. He thought that she might need to be comforted. In any case, it would be impossible for one lone person to take on the mysterious organization by themselves. But don't be discouraged, Miss Nora. To be honest, you can also establish and build your own forces. If you can't become a top-class hacker like Q and XYZ, then bring them under you. As for the Imperial League, if you can get in touch with their members, even if it's just a bit of contact with one of them, you can slowly try to grow and develop a relationship with them. When that happens, and we gain the ability to fight against the mysterious organization, then I will tell you the truth. You don't have to think it is that difficult. Although it is certainly hard, we can take it slow. Even though I have already reached an old age, you are still young. Five years, ten years, you still have a long way ahead of you. You will definitely find your chance to take down your enemy. Nora nodded her head. There is indeed a chance. He was taken aback for a moment. Then he heard Nora slowly say, My hacking skills should be more or less on par with XYZ's, because I am Q. Old Maddie was dumbfounded, but right after that he heard something even more incredible. Nora continued, And, well, it's hard to fight against the big brother of the Irvin School of Martial Arts, because he won't fight me. But I can't fight the big sister of the Quinn School of Martial Arts either, because I am big sister. Shall I strive to surpass myself every day? He looked at Nora in shock, a feeling of disbelief filling his soul. His lips started to tremble, and then he watched the girl frown as she said, As for the escape you mentioned, I'm afraid I won't need help with that, because I've never lost a race before. With his lips trembling, he was already asking, y you are also Yancey? That is correct. Nora did feel that it was a little embarrassing to reveal all of her secrets. After all, it wasn't exactly classy of her to show off exactly how amazing she was. It would be best if old Maddie could have guessed the truth through what she had told him, but she knew that probably wasn't going to happen. He had to ask. But, but, the Imperial League... As though it was nothing much, Nora said, Oh, the boss of the Imperial League is king. This part is certainly a bit difficult. Old Maddie breathed a sigh of relief, but right after he heard her slowly say, After all, everyone in the Imperial League only interacts online. They rarely meet in person, so even I don't know who king is. If they ever hold a gathering, I can compare myself with him and see which of us is more impressive. He became even more dumbfounded. His face, which was already disfigured in the first place, was unable to make expressions, easily making him seem dull and dim-witted. The man was more dazed at the moment. In fact, he swallowed and looked at Nora incredulously as he said, You... you... you're a member of the Imperial League? I am. Nora stretched out her long and slender legs and said, King invited me into the group five years ago. Old Maddie felt like he was really going crazy. His jaw had dropped, and he couldn't even say a single word as he stood there like a statue. Then he heard Nora slowly say, My mother warned me that I shouldn't casually expose my identity if I'm not strong enough, because it will put me in grave danger. Therefore, I have been using secret identities and living a low-profile life all these years. Maybe you can tell me what else I am still not good enough at, and I'll go and master it. Nora frowned, pretending to feel troubled. 
Now that you know the truth, perhaps you will consider me strong enough? Why did it feel like Ms. Nora was humble bragging to him? Utterly stunned, he swallowed and said, Ms. Nora, I need a bit of time to calm myself down. Nora waved, gesturing to him to do whatever he wanted. Old Maddie walked back and forth in the room, occasionally sighing and looking at Nora in disbelief. He felt like he was dreaming. How could a person have that many secret identities? Was this because of the gene serum that Yvette had injected into Nora to improve her IQ? But he clearly remembered that she had only injected a tiny, small amount into her young daughter. Still, how could this be possible? The room was filled with a strange silence. Old Maddie, who had taken some time to calm himself down, suddenly said, Let, let me go and rinse my face to clear my mind a little. It seemed that even the amount of time he had spent calming himself down just now hadn't allowed him to come to terms with all of this new information. He entered the bathroom in a daze and turned on the faucet. Then he scooped a handful of icy cold water and splashed it onto his face. As it turned out, during these 20 odd years that he had been crazy, Ms. Nora had become this outstanding human being. If Miss Yvette had still been alive, she would have been so proud. Outside, Nora heard him turn on the faucet. Amid the sound of the flowing water and splashing, she seemed to hear old Maddie sigh. A minute later, the sound of water flowing was still continuing. Sensing that something was wrong, Nora sprung onto her feet and rushed straight into the bathroom, only to find that the window in the bathroom was wide open and old Maddie was already long gone. Nora frowned. She had been thinking about how old Maddie and Charles seemed to be hiding something from her. But she didn't expect old Maddie to pull a disappearing act in this situation. The first thing she did was observe the room. There were no signs of tussling, but the anti-theft barrier outside the window had been broken. This definitely was not something that could be done in a minute or two. Nora frowned. At this moment, her cell phone beeped. It was a text message from an unfamiliar number. It read, Ms. Nora, even though you have already become very strong, you are still not strong enough to contend with the mysterious organization. Do not underestimate anyone in this world. Your next task is to become friends with King. Until then, do not go up against the mysterious organization. She raised her eyebrows. Where had old Maddie gotten a phone? She sent him a reply. Where are you? And how can you not know that King and I are friends already? Five years ago, in order to make some money to feed Cherry, she had set up a stock market boom. Without risking anything of her own, she had used some lawful tricks in the stock market to make $75 million. After that, King had taken the initiative to contact her and added her to the Imperial League. At the moment she entered the Imperial League, she had become friends with King. Old Maddie texted, Do you trust him? Yes. And does he trust you? Nora thought for a while and texted back, Probably. At the very least, when King added her into the group, he'd said in private that everyone in the group be friendly towards one another and each other out. During the past five years, King hadn't asked her to do anything. In the group, she was no different than an observer. After monitoring the Imperial League for the entire five years, she found that the members were all very low-key and they mostly talked about world economic trends. These people were in control of global economies. No matter what they did, 
they discussed everything thoroughly with one another. Even if a dispute broke out, a single word from King was enough to shut them up. From her impression, the members were all very happy to help each other. Additionally, none of them had ever questioned information brought up by other members of the group. They had always given their fellow members unconditional trust. Therefore, Nora felt that she could trust King and that King would also trust her. After all, it wasn't as if the two of them would have any financial dealings with one another. Besides, King was polite. He was the only one who knew what she was capable of, yet had never ever disturbed her sleep. Instead, just like that, he had allowed her to be a spectator of the group. But old Maddie wasn't satisfied with Nora's reply. Old Maddie texted, Ms. Nora, do not ever trust anyone. The same also goes for King. You should know that what makes the mysterious organization so powerful is not as simple as you think it is. I'm afraid even King wouldn't want to be enemies with them. But unfortunately, if there is someone in this world who can help you beat the mysterious organization, then that person would undoubtedly be King. She had always felt that she was very ordinary and was not strong enough. That was why she had kept her secret identities well protected and prevented them from being exposed. She wanted to avoid what her mother had warned her about, the fact that she would be in danger if anyone took notice of her. Nora sent another message. How can I get King to help me? The mysterious organization had driven her mother to her grave, therefore she wanted to avenge her. However, old Maddie merely replied, King will not help you unless he is the children's father. Only then will he have the same standpoint as you. Ms. Nora, listen to my advice. Don't trust King unconditionally. And don't even think about avenging Miss Yvette. Take the two children and Mr. Hunt with you and live out the rest of your life in the States peacefully. Miss Yvette had never thought of having you take revenge for her. And another thing, don't look for me. I will tell you that there are some things that I will do on your behalf. When it is time for me to appear, I will naturally show up in front of you. Also, if you are ever in trouble, you can contact me by posting a newspaper ad like I showed you. Nora hurriedly sent a message. What are you going to do on my behalf? Old Maddie didn't reply. When Nora called his cell phone directly, she was informed that the other party had switched off their device. She traced the location of the cell phone number, only to find that its coordinates were changing along with the flow of the sewer, indicating that old Maddie had already removed the SIM card and tossed the device down the sewer drain. Old Maddie was very professional, or at least that was certainly the case when he was hiding from people. He knew all the right things to do to stay off the grid. Five minutes later, Lily brought the surveillance camera footage from the hospital. This private hospital was part of the Hunt Corporation, where Lily behaved almost as casually as she would at home, since she practically lived here. With a word from her, the security guards had given her the surveillance camera footage without a question. Nora sat in old Maddie's ward and checked the footage. She found that after old Maddie regained clarity of mind, the first thing he had done was check his surroundings. Every morning when he went to the toilet at a fixed time, he carried a paring knife with him. Through the footage of the cameras on the outside, it was apparent that old Maddie had been sawing through the anti-theft barrier every day when he went to the bathroom as part of his morning routine. However, he also made sure that the barrier appeared to be in place. This way, when it became necessary for him to remove it, the anti-theft barrier could be easily moved away with very little effort, thereby making it convenient for him to escape and preventing him from being trapped in the ward. Old Maddie hadn't been trying to avoid Nora when he did all of this. After all, his eyes were very gentle and void of hostility when he looked at her. So these subconscious actions of his, as well as his uneasiness, clearly indicated that he was hiding from someone or something. 
Who was it? There was only one answer. The mysterious organization. Yes, old Maddie was constantly on guard against sneak attacks from the mysterious organization. Nora clenched her jaw and lowered her eyes. To be honest, she had been underestimating the mysterious organization all this time. After all, when Truman was in the country, he had almost been arrested. He had been hiding from the special department the whole time, like a pest that could only survive while living in the shadows. It was only now that she suddenly realized the real reason why her mother hadn't worked with the Smiths, to fight against the mysterious organization, after she returned to the States. She didn't want to implicate Ian. So why had her mother fled? Because the mysterious organization was so powerful. It had never been an organization that one had the luxury to underestimate. Otherwise, how could her brilliant mother have been driven into a corner like that? Nora felt like she hadn't taken the mysterious organization seriously enough. From the very beginning, this way of thinking was wrong. Old Maddie must have also sensed that from her. That was why he had refused to reveal anything and had chosen to leave instead of answering her questions. But just how capable was the mysterious organization? While Nora was musing over this, her phone rang with a call from Justin. When she answered, his low voice came over the phone. Old Maddie escaped. The comings and goings in the Hunt Corporation's private hospital would no doubt be reported to him immediately. He did, Nora replied dispassionately, but her voice was full of frustration. This was the first time she had felt so powerless. Justin kept quiet for a while before he finally said, I'll get my men to look for him. No, it's fine. Nora stopped Justin. She said, After so many years, he has finally become sober. It's time that he ceased his own business. Besides, going by old Maddie's professional spy-like demeanor, she knew it would be really hard to find him. Justin was taken aback for a moment. He asked, Then you're not going to find out from him what you really want to know. When Nora heard this, she suddenly curled her lips into a smile. She raised her eyebrows and said, He may have left, but isn't there still another one here? Old Maddie must have thought that Charles was doomed. He must have thought that even if Charles came too, the cerebral hemorrhage would still make him a vegetable. But he definitely had no way of knowing that she had saved Charles's life. What was Old Maddie trying to hide? Nora's hope was that Charles would confess it all. Since he was someone capable of betraying her mother, Nora could guarantee that she would be able to pry what she wanted out of him. When Justin heard this, he let out a low chuckle. You know, I always thought my Nora was incredible, but I didn't expect you to be this amazing. Everyone thought Charles was a dead man walking, yet you managed to save him. Nora smiled. A compliment from Justin was music to her ears. She came very close to a happy giggle, but she held back. Instead, she asked, By the way, may I ask you about someone? As the head of the number one family in the United States, Justin would probably know who King was. It wouldn't hurt to ask, right? Old Maddie had said that Nora would only be able to fight against the mysterious organization if King was willing to help her. Nora currently didn't even know why she had to fight against the mysterious organization, let alone what exactly they were hiding. But she still wondered, if she succeeded in building a good relationship with King, then did that mean Old Maddie would return? And how was she going to build a good relationship with King if she didn't even know who he was. Justin was the head of the number one family in the country 
which contributed to Nora's assumption all this time that he was actually the person with the alias Eagle in the Imperial League. After all, there was no doubt that there were Americans in the Imperial League. Through her observations over the years, even though both the Hunt Corporation and the Smith Corporation had made some bad investments, they had skillfully avoided the huge pitfalls when it mattered the most. And, although they had made great efforts to advertise how much they had lost, they had still profited overall. Their overall direction had not deviated from the right path. The small investment failures were just red herrings. Had Nora not been relatively sensitive to numerical data, she probably wouldn't have noticed either. These two families definitely had a way to get news from the Imperial League. Therefore, it could be concluded that Justin and Joel must both be in the Imperial League. While she was thinking, she heard Justin ask over the phone, Who is it that you are looking for? Nora asked, Where are you? At home. I'll come to you. I don't want to talk over the phone. Some things have to be discussed in person. The Imperial League was not something that could be talked about casually. Moreover, when they joined the Imperial League, they had sworn that they would never expose the existence of the Imperial League to outsiders. She suspected that Justin was Eagle, which is why she had decided to ask him about it. However, she knew that it was not safe to discuss such matters over the phone. Even Justin's voice sounded a little more cheerful than before. He said, Sure, come over to my place then. Pete is here. She hesitated for a moment. Why is Pete there? A tinge of guilt suddenly formed in her. Had she neglected her son because she was too busy lately? Because the hunts are having exams today, Cherry can't cope. She thought about it for a moment and then inquired, how many people know about Pete and Cherry? The fact that they were twins had not yet been disclosed to the public. But because everyone who should know about it was already in the know, Justin and Nora were not as diligent about hiding it anymore. Justin answered, All the hunts know about it by now. Nora noticed that he had used the words hunts and not my family. She could clearly see that Justin did not have a strong sense of belonging to the hunts. However, it didn't bother her. The hunts' power and authority had never been part of her consideration in being in a relationship with Justin anyway. Therefore, after uttering a, hmm, she immediately said, I'm coming over right away. At the hunt manor, the children were gathered in the hunts' family school. Pete put down his pen after he finished the exams. When the bell rang, indicating that class was over, he handed in his papers and walked out of class. As soon as he went out, he saw Cherry sitting in the garden outside playing games. At the sight of him, she rushed over excitedly and asked, Are the games over, Pete? Did you get a perfect score? Pete replied, Most likely. You're so awesome, Pete. Cherry's words of flattery meant that she wanted something. Pete is the smartest big brother in the world. He's also the most awesome big brother in the world. Although Cherry did this every time she wanted something from him, he wasn't comfortable with so many compliments from her. He lowered his voice and changed the subject. Where is that little imp? Cherry also lowered her voice. He's in the room. He has been surprisingly well-behaved, and he hasn't left his room all this time. Well-behaved? Pete wasn't buying it. Pete sneered. He's definitely just pretending to have manners. Come on, I will go and meet him. I will definitely expose his true colors. Cherry nodded and followed behind him. When the two were about to leave the school, Freddy rushed over. Pete, you little idiot. Your position as successor to the family will be gone very soon. He pretended to cry like a baby. Nanny, nanny, boo-boo. Freddy slapped Pete on his back. That's so awesome. As soon as he said this, 
the rest of the children began to ask, what happened? Freddie replied, because Uncle Justin now has an illegitimate child and he brought him back home. Pete won't be Uncle Justin's only son anymore. They're saying that the illegitimate child is not to be messed with. So it sounds like you're finished, Pete. Cherry got angry and stood in front of her brother. Pete is Daddy's one and only successor. Xander is nothing. Don't you dare talk nonsense. Freddy, however, became distracted. Ever since he realized that Cherry was Pete's younger sister, he knew that the person playing games with him was Cherry all along. It was precisely this little liar who had bullied him online. At the sight of Cherry, Freddy wanted to seek revenge even more. He shouted, You must be Cherry, right? What gives you the right to look down on Uncle Justin's illegitimate son? He's at least a boy, but what about you? Uncle Justin has not even officially introduced you to outsiders yet. You are just an illegitimate daughter who can't inherit anything. You can't compare to either son. Her big dark eyes widened and she said, Oh, I see. So you are also an illegitimate son, Freddy. No wonder Uncle Roger has been treating you so badly. He retorted, I'm not an illegitimate son. What nonsense are you saying? Cherry said, But you said that because Daddy didn't introduce me to outsiders, that makes me an illegitimate daughter. But when has Uncle Roger ever introduced you to outsiders? For a moment, he was actually stumped by Cherry's argument. After thinking about it, he felt like what she said must be true. Why didn't his father introduce him to outsiders and say that he was his son? Maybe there was something wrong with him. Cherry tilted her head and continued, Or are you not Uncle Roger's son at all? I mean, you don't look anything like him. Uncle Roger is so handsome. He's as handsome as Daddy. So how can you possibly be his son? Oh, I know. Uncle Roger must have found you in our basket somewhere and brought you back home, right? Close to tears, Freddy cried out, I am my father's son. Cherry put her hands on her hips. And how are you going to prove that? Freddy was utterly stumped. Suddenly, he burst into tears, turned around, and ran out while yelling, Daddy, am I your son or not? With just a few words, Cherry had driven Freddy away. She blinked with her big eyes at Pete and shook her head lightly. He can be so sensitive sometimes. Then she giggled. He took Cherry's hand and said, All right, let's go home. He couldn't be bothered to argue with Freddy. All Pete had to do was a little something and Freddy would have a hard time in school. But the sight of his younger sister standing up for him put him in a really good mood. As payback, he planned to go home right away and teach Xander a lesson for making his sister worry. Hand in hand, the two kids hopped and skipped as they ran over to the villa where Justin lived. They didn't even see that Justin was standing not far away. And they certainly didn't see that their mother was coming up the drive. After her conversation with old Maddie, Nora drove straight over to Justin's villa. The moment she walked through the gate, the security guard notified Justin of her arrival. By the time Nora pulled into the circular drive, Justin was waiting for her. She stopped the SUV and he came around to open the door. When Nora got out, she saw this serious look on Justin's face. She quickly asked, what's wrong? After a short pause, Justin blurted out, I'm thinking of celebrating Cherry's birthday. Nora was surprised. It was only then that she realized it would be Cherry's birthday in five days. Even though that day was Cherry's birthday, it was also the day she had lost Pete. So she had rarely celebrated the day in the past. Besides, when they were abroad, they had very few relatives with them. Basically, when it was Cherry's birthday, her aunt would just prepare a small gift for the little girl 
and buy her a cake. Nora considered. Justin was such a private person. Surely he would keep the celebration to the bare minimum, inviting only family and friends. But what actually had happened surprised her no end. Nora looked at him hesitantly, only to see Justin nodding his head and announcing his idea. I want to hold a grand birthday party and formally introduce Cherry and Pete to the public. Nora was shocked. In the past, he had kept Pete very well protected and avoided letting outsiders know what he looked like in order to prevent him from being kidnapped. But now that Pete was five years old, there was less of a need to continue hiding him. At the very least, it was time to let New Yorkers familiarize themselves with Pete and Cherry. Swirling rumors had said that he kept the children hidden as if he had no intention of acknowledging them as his own. Nora searched his face, trying to figure out what had happened to change Justin's mind. Whatever it was, she knew that she would never object to something that would make Cherry so happy. She knew that Cherry loved excitement. She had always chatted away about how lovely and exciting Princess Lucy's birthdays were. Princess Lucy had so many people visiting her to give her birthday gifts, but Cherry didn't have any friends at all. Cherry wanted to wear a beautiful princess dress, open wonderful gifts, and gracefully thank everyone for attending the party. And now, her father could finally make that wish come true for her. She was going to be on cloud nine. Nora asked, Are you going to hold it at the hunts? Justin nodded. Yes, I'll let the butler handle it so you don't need to worry about anything. I know how busy you are. With the planning and execution of a little girl's birthday party off her plate, Nora agreed to the idea at once. As the two had talked, they were walking toward the living room. When they entered, they were just in time to see the three children sitting in the living room and playing with building blocks. Pete was arranging the blocks, while Cherry and Xander were directing him from either side. Cherry pointed in one direction. Pete, it seems like that block should be placed here. Xander pointed to the opposite side. Hey, it's obviously supposed to be placed here, isn't it? Pete kept a gentle expression on his face and looked at Cherry. He said, I think Xander is right. Cherry thought for a while and then said, I think so too. Xander was immediately suspicious. Why had they agreed with him so quickly? He was confused as to what was happening and was about to ask when Nora and Justin walked in. All they saw was the three little tykes having fun together. This surprised both Nora and Justin. Both of them knew very well that each of these children had strong personalities, and the two adults in the room doubted the three children would ever get along. From Nora's perspective, Cherry had the personality of a CEO with the appearance of a little girl. Cherry would never tolerate someone else taking her place. She undoubtedly would be full of hostility towards Xander. From Justin's perspective, although his son was polite, he was also quite a scheming little boy. Coupled with his insecurities, he could be very territorial. Cherry and Pete accepted each other so quickly because they looked so much alike and knew that they were related. And they used this fact to devise a plot to bring their parents together by switching places with one another. But both Nora and Justin knew that their children were definitely not people who could easily accept another child into their world. Justin and Nora looked at each other. Then Justin asked, What are you guys doing? Cherry immediately raised her little head. Daddy, we're playing together. Pete and I both like our little brother Xander very much. Xander frowned and stomped his foot. I told you, I'm older. Cherry rolled her eyes. In that case, when were you born? I was born on September the 8th. It will be my birthday in five days. Oh, yeah, it will also be Pete's birthday. We are twins, so we have the same birthday. What about you? When's your birthday? When Cherry asked the question, Nora immediately looked over at Xander. Birthday? 
That's right, she asked when Xander was born. If he shared the same birthday as Cherry and Pete, then wouldn't that explain whether he was their brother? But when Xander heard Cherry asking about his birthday, he was slightly taken aback. Then he lowered his head, coughed, and said, I never had a mother, so how would I know when my birthday is? Cherry blinked. Pete walked over and said, Then why don't we celebrate our birthday together? I have never celebrated my birthday before either. Xander immediately looked up. Really? Yeah. Xander's eyes lit up at Pete's answer. He raised his chin and said proudly, Okay then. Pete then looked at Justin. Daddy, can the three of us celebrate our birthday together this year? Seeing how the three children seemed to be getting along, Justin couldn't resist and answered, Sure. After agreeing to the children's request, he went upstairs with Nora so that they could speak in private. It seemed that Nora had wanted to ask him about someone just now. After they disappeared from the corridor, the smiles on Pete and Cherry's faces disappeared, and they glared narrowly at Xander, who was playing on the opposite side of the room. Cherry whispered, Pete, why are you letting him celebrate his birthday with us? Pete replied softly, If I don't invite him, Daddy will sympathize with him because he looks so pitiful. Once he starts to feel sorry for Xander, Daddy will become biased, and this will be unfair to Mummy. Cherry was enlightened. No wonder you told me to be nice to him in front of Daddy. If we bully him, Daddy will also feel bad for him, right? Pete nodded. Yeah. He was so proud of himself. This was the strategy he had devised all along. After the two spoke, they both looked at Xander. Xander was pointing at a block. Put this one here. Okay. But instead of doing it, Pete tossed the block in his hand onto the table and said, You know what? This is so boring. You can play by yourself. Pete rubbed his nose and walked away. Xander thought to himself, What was that brat being so arrogant for? If it weren't for Cherry, would I even want to play such childish games with him? Meanwhile upstairs, Justin started to explain his theory about Pete's suggestion to Nora. Pete is very clever. Although he seemed to be defending Xander just now, he probably has a sneaky little plan in mind. So, in order not to make a scene, I could only agree to what he asked. When the time comes, I will find some excuse to get Xander out of the house so that we can celebrate Cherry and Pete's birthdays as we had planned. He didn't want Nora to feel uncomfortable. He also didn't want her or anyone else to think that he was putting Xander on the same level as Cherry and Pete, especially since they hadn't even confirmed the boy's identity yet. To be honest, Justin still had conflicting emotions even now. He had deliberately lessened his contact with Xander at home precisely because he was afraid of developing feelings for him. If it turned out that Xander was not Nora's, he feared that even if he decided to raise the child, he would never be able to truly accept him. And that would be so unfair to Xander. But if he treated Xander like his own and kept him by his side, the one suffering an injustice would then end up being Nora. That would be an impossible situation. It didn't feel right that he should leave the situation in Nora's hands, so he knew that he would have to make the choice himself. When Nora heard this, she was silent for a moment. Honestly, she did not feel much hostility towards the boy. Besides, even though Charles said that she had given birth to twins, she couldn't help but keep feeling like Xander was also her child. This feeling was becoming more and more intense with each encounter. If they only celebrated the twins' birthday and neglected Xander, she wouldn't feel right about it. Nora lowered her eyes. Once Justin had made his feelings clear, the first thing she did was take out her cell phone to call Lily. As usual, Lily answered quickly. Boss, what's up? When can you complete Xander's DNA restoration? Lily replied, In a week at the latest, 
But that's if I work overtime and if I make sure the DNA restoration is all I'm working on. Which means, boss, that you can't ask me to do anything else during the week. Nora kept quiet for a moment before she said, All right. She was about to disconnect, but then she asked, When will Charles wake up? See, boss, what did I just say? That question would be defined as another task. For now, we anticipate that he may wake up sometime within the week. Nora nodded. Okay, here are your options. Either you finish restoring Xander's DNA within five days, or you get Charles to wake up within five days. It's your choice. She could hear Lily sigh as she disconnected. She knew it would be difficult, but she had to know. If Xander really was her son, then she was going to celebrate his birthday right along with her twins. So this meant she needed the DNA confirmation before the birthday celebration. After hanging up the phone with Lily, Nora followed Justin into the study. Justin closed the door thoughtfully and looked at her with a smile. What do you want to ask me? She could tell from the smile on his face that he was very happy. He felt that Nora was finally willing to come to him when she was faced with a problem. This feeling of being needed gave him an indescribable sense of satisfaction. But she just stared at him, having no idea what he was thinking. She studied him for a moment and then took the plunge. Do you know Eagle? Justin was taken aback for a moment. He asked hesitantly, What? Nora was surprised by his expression. Justin had always been very relaxed in front of her, but when she said the code name Eagle just now, Justin did not react at all. What could that mean? Wasn't he Eagle? During her hesitation, Justin inquired again, What Eagle? A code name Eagle? What organization is he from? Not a very clever alias, it is quite common. Although there was an eagle in the Imperial League, the code name was simply too common. He needed to ask her to properly clarify. However, his reaction made Nora feel that she had been incorrect in her assumption. She felt quite certain that he was not eagle, so Nora kept silent for a while. When they joined the Imperial League, they had sworn that they would not tell outsiders about its existence. They were allowed to use the information they got from within the organization to help their relatives, but they were not allowed to reveal the source. Outside, they were not permitted to even mention the Imperial League. If Justin was not Eagle, then that meant she was not allowed to talk to him about anything regarding the Imperial League, let alone ask him who King was. Nora knew that the Imperial League was not a place to break the rules. In the end, she chose not to ask him about it anymore. She said, Never mind, I've got my answer. Justin glanced at her with a puzzled look on his face. He wanted to say something, but paused when the butler knocked on the door. Justin opened the door to let the butler in. The butler questioned, Sir, do you need something? Justin considered for a moment, he glanced at Nora, and then he replied, I would like to throw a birthday party five days from now for Pete and Cherry. We'll be celebrating their fifth birthday. Make the necessary preparations. The butler was bewildered. For wealthy families like the Hunts, if they wanted to throw a birthday party even for their children, they would have to make reservations and other arrangements months in advance. Five days was simply not enough time. It was much too late for anything to be customized now. But whatever Mr. Hunt wanted, it was up to him to make it happen in time. After clearing his throat, the butler simply questioned, Will it be a grand party or a small one? Send an invite to just family and friends. The butler breathed a sigh of relief. Apparently, it wasn't going to be necessary to invite his business associates. Justin was planning to introduce Cherry to everyone within the family circle, so there was no need to invite business associates as well. 
However, the butler knew he had better get to it. Even if it was only family and friends, it would still be a medium-sized party, perhaps around a thousand guests. And the thing about the hunts was this. If they received an invitation, they had to attend. Although the butler was anxious, he nevertheless simply nodded his head and said, Yes, sir. May I be excused? Then he added, Unless there is anything else, sir. There isn't. Very well, then. I will begin making preparations right away. He went about to prepare the party invitations, the menu, as well as all the servants' assignments. Moreover, as there would be a lot of guests on that day, he would also have to prepare sufficient parking spaces and arrange for extra security personnel. The Hunt's Manor would be abuzz with activity shortly. With a simple request of the children's birthday party, Justin had added a ton of work for the butler and the entire staff. Before leaving the room, the butler confirmed with Justin, The birthday party is for both Mr. Pete and Ms. Cherry, I presume. It is indeed, replied Justin with a nod. With that, the butler clicked his heels, bowed, and went out. Nora yawned and explained that she couldn't stay any longer. After all, she had ended up wasting some time giving Charles medical treatment, and it was time for her to go home to sleep. The strange thing, though, was that Pete, who usually followed Nora around everywhere, had actually taken the initiative to say that he wanted to stay at the hunts. He gave her the excuse that if he went with her to the Smiths, he might disturb her rest. He had asked so nicely that all Nora could do was to agree with his request. But after thinking about it, she turned back to Pete and offered earnestly, Pete, don't bully the boy, okay? Pete fell silent for a moment when he heard her. Then he tilted his head and asked, but what if he bullies you, mummy? Nora smiled and ruffled his hair. Her voice was very low but reassuring as she said, I know you're a sweet boy who wants to look out for me, but there is no one capable of bullying mummy. Do you understand? Pete looked up at her. Nora was very tall. At this age, Pete was only as tall as her waist. In his eyes, his mummy was gentle and strong. In front of his mother, he abandoned all his sneaky thoughts and conspiracies, wanting only to be the most well-behaved child for her. He relaxed and nodded. Okay, mummy. After she left, the twins watched her drive away. Still standing at the window, Cherry asked, Pete, are we planning to keep our distance from Xander? Pete kept quiet for a long while before he finally replied, let's put all our plans on hold for the moment. We'll take action only if Xander bullies mummy or if mummy suffers injustice because of him. If that happens, we absolutely won't tolerate his existence in this family. Okie dokie, Cherry clapped. But then she thought for a moment and wondered why she was so happy that they weren't pushing Xander away anymore. How could that be? It must be that she found Xander really pitiful because he didn't have a mum. She could never admit that she did like Xander even a teeny weeny little bit. After the two children spoke to each other, they went up the stairs hand in hand to play. Neither of them saw Xander walking down the hallway. He stared angrily in the direction where the twins had gone. He was even holding his favorite book about human anatomy, as well as a doll detailing a human's body structure. Initially, for Cherry's sake, he had wanted to make friends with Pete. But after Pete said that it was very boring playing building blocks with him, he went back upstairs to fetch his favorite learning toy. But he hadn't expected to hear such conversation. They wanted to drive him away. They were too cruel. Weren't they all daddy's children and wasn't this daddy's house? Why should he be driven away just because he didn't share the same birthday as them? The thought of this made Xander angry. The little boy clenched his fists. Suddenly, he turned and went back upstairs. After entering his bedroom, the angry Xander threw his doll onto the floor, causing it to break into pieces. 
a look of hostility flashed across his face. Before he could continue his tantrum, his cell phone rang. Xander hastily picked up the call without looking at the number. Truman's evil and slightly shrill voice came over from the other side. My dearest Xander, how have you been? Fine, Xander replied curtly. Since I have you, Dad, when is my birthday? When Truman heard this, he paused. Then he chuckled and replied, September 8th, why do you want to know? September 8th. So his birthday was the same as Cherry and Pete's. Xander was stunned. He wasn't expecting September 8th to be his birthday too. But he chose not to tell Truman the truth about why he asked. He instead replied, Oh, okay, I was just wondering. Then he asked, Daddy, do you think I really won't be able to get along with my new father? Truman sneered. Do you have to even ask? I mean, does Justin Hunt treat you well? Xander thought for a moment and answered, Not too well, but not that bad either. And what about Nora Smith? Xander tilted his head. She treats me well enough, too. She didn't drive me away, nor did she quarrel with Justin to get him to send me away. Instead, she is very calm, as if she doesn't care about my existence. Oh, really? Truman sounded a little unhappy. That a woman sure is big-hearted. Or perhaps it is the opposite. Perhaps she doesn't love Justin Hunt at all. If she did, how would it be possible for her to forgive her man for having a child with another woman? Xander touched his nose in the same manner as Pete. Is there a chance that she thinks I'm cute so she can't bear to do anything to me? Truman laughed out loud. Do you really think a woman would find her husband's illegitimate child cute? Xander felt very uncomfortable being called an illegitimate child. But he didn't get angry because he understood that Truman was right. He didn't have a mother, but was instead Justin's child from some unknown woman. So that would make him an illegitimate child. Truman went on. Don't be fooled by their superficial actions. Adults' affairs are much more complicated than you might think. They don't care about you at the moment, only because you haven't grown up, so you're not a threat to Peter Hunt's position yet. But if you become outstanding enough to become the next heir to the Hunts, how do you think they will treat you then? Xander pushed his feelings deep down and didn't speak. Truman scoffed. Have you forgotten about Prince Charlie? He is also an illegitimate child. His stepmother deliberately raised him to be a good-for-nothing. That is why you must find a way to drive Pete out of the Hunt household. This is the only way you can become Justin Hunt's one and only son. Do you understand the significance of that, Xander? Xander narrowed his eyes. Yes, Daddy. Although he felt that Truman was wrong, he did not refute him. Ever since he was a baby, he had known that there would be severe punishment waiting for him if he ever disagreed with his father's words. Xander heaved a small sigh. After the phone call ended, the young boy pondered for a few minutes, weighing the potential consequences. Then he stood up and walked out. He was going to find Cherry and Pete, so he could tell them that his birthday was also on September 8th. And that meant that they could all share the birthday party together. Xander had completely forgotten Truman's instructions. The excited boy went to look for Pete and Cherry. But when he walked up to the door of the room where the twins were, he was instead stopped by a few children. These children were all from Pete's uncles and aunts' families. They were about 10 years old. From a young age, their parents had told them to curry favors with Pete and had also forbidden the children from bullying him. When they heard that Pete was back, 
they came over to specifically play with him. However, they didn't expect Pete to refuse visitations again. They didn't like to be snubbed, and they were bored. Just as they were about to leave, they ran into Xander. The little pack of brats had a lot of pent-up anger, and they were ready to direct it at any child of Justin's other than Pete. One of the older kids said loudly, Is that Uncle Justin's illegitimate son? Someone replied, He does look a little like Uncle Justin, but what a pity that he is a little bastard without a mother. There's no way he can inherit the hunt's fortune, isn't that so? Yeah, yeah, I even heard that he grew up with monsters in the wild. Can you speak human language? Come on, make a sound so we can hear it. A few of them ganged up on Xander. They pushed him back and forth between them. You're Xander, right? Who's your mother? He doesn't have a mother. Shoot, he doesn't even know when his birthday is. So how did he get here? Did he crawl out from under a rock? Are you here to play with Pete? What makes you think you can play with him? How can you be worthy of playing with him? He is the rightful son of the leader of the Hunt household. And what about you? You're an illegitimate child. You can't even compare to Pete's little finger. Why are you so quiet? Are you stupid? Pete is the smartest of us all, you know. I bet your IQ is not even a fraction of his. Also, did anyone tell you that a birthday party will be held in a few days? Uncle Justin is holding it so that he can announce to everyone that Cherry is his daughter. I wonder if anyone will even remember to invite you. The children were just repeating what they had secretly heard from the adults. As soon as the boy named Xander had arrived, everyone was talking about him. When someone asked if Pete's status would be threatened by Xander, everyone immediately refuted him. Not only had Pete exhibited a high IQ since he was a baby, but his mother came from the Smith family. With a status like hers, she would certainly be able to protect Pete from any illegitimate child that weaseled their way into the Hunt home. Therefore, everyone looked down on Xander. The children's badgering made Xander clench his fists. He stared at the kids in front of him. Although he very much wanted to charge forward and scratch their faces, he couldn't do that. Every one of them was much bigger and stronger than he was. He focused his attention on the lead bully. The kid mocked him. He said, I heard you grew up with cats and dogs. Did you sleep in a kennel with them? Can you talk like a dog? Xander narrowed his eyes and touched his nose. Then he slowly grinned. Of course, not only can I talk like a dog, but I can even. He whispered something so quietly that the kids had to lean forward in order to hear what he said. He stood back with his arms crossed as the children around him let out a unified, ah! The leader of the children immediately took a step forward. He asked curiously, what else do you know? Xander grinned, come over here. I can only tell you about it. We don't want the others to know now, do we? The idiot leaned into Xander's face craning his neck and turning his head to better hear the secret. Okay. Xander had reeled him in and seized the opportunity to get his reward. With his sharp little teeth, he clamped down on the bully's ear. Ow! An ear-piercing scream rattled the windows. The kid shoved Xander away, but that made the pain worse because Xander wouldn't let go. The rest of the children rushed forward to beat and kick Xander, but he held on, and, like a pit bull, he refused to release his bite. It wasn't until his teeth had pierced all the way through the child's ear that he finally let go. As the little idiot was rolling on the floor in pain, Xander grinned and said, In addition to knowing how to bark like a dog, I also know how to bite like one. He stretched out his hand and looked at the others cowering in the doorway. Anyone else want to accuse me of barking like a dog? After saying that, his malevolent eyes glared at the other children. Xander had blood at the corner of his lips, 
making him look even more menacing. When the children saw their leader bleeding profusely, they became so frightened that they dispersed at once. Run! Also scared, the lead bully clasped a hand to his bloody bitten ear. He wasn't about to be left alone with this monster. He rushed out, following the other children. Watching them leave, Xander wiped the corners of his mouth with the back of his hand. He shrugged his shoulders, rolled his eyes, and walked toward Justin's study. He was going to tell his father that his birthday was also on September 8th, so that meant he was not an illegitimate child. He would get his father to announce to everyone on his birthday that he, Xander Yale, was also his son. Behind the study door, Justin leaned far back in his desk chair. He speculated when Xander's birthday was. If it was also September 8th, wouldn't that pretty much confirm that Nora was his mother too? Xander hid outside the door and secretly observed Justin. He saw the man frowning, seemingly troubled. The man looked like he was contemplating, and while he did, he kept touching his nose. Xander, whose hand was also touching his nose, paused. He blinked, studied his hand for a moment, and then put it down by his side. Before arriving outside Justin's study, he had wanted to tell the tyrant about his birthday. He also wanted to get him to publicly announce that he was also Justin's son on that day at the birthday party. But after he arrived, he was a little afraid to go in. What if Daddy Tyrant refused to celebrate his birthday for him even after he told him about it? He stood frozen contemplating until he heard a commotion coming from a distance away. Xander turned to see that the group of misbehaving kids had returned and were coming up the hallway. And, to make matters worse, this time they had brought their parents with them. Jack Hunt, the leader of the group and the bully whose ear Xander had bitten, was crying. His eyes were completely red. He held his mother's hand as he walked over. His ear hadn't been bandaged yet. Although he wasn't bleeding anymore, the wound still looked shocking. As soon as he walked over, Jack pointed at Xander and complained, That's him, Mummy. He's the one who bit my ear. Jack was a child from the Hunt's side family. His family had attached themselves to the main family line, which meant that they were dependent upon the Hunt Corporation for their livelihood. Jack's mother was also considered to be from a wealthy and prestigious family. She looked straight at Xander, her finger nearly jabbing his face as she demanded, What's the matter with you, punk? What makes you think you can bully my son? Can't you talk it out properly with them? Did you have to bite him, or are you a dog? Her voice was so loud that Justin could hear it from the other side of the thick wooden door, which he slowly opened. When Jack's mother saw Justin, she immediately started crying. She said, Justin, look, that little monster nearly bit off Jack's ear. He is too much. She cried and said, My little Jack has always been such a sensitive boy. I've always told him that even though he is a few years older, that he should always give in to Pete and keep him happy. After all, Pete is still quite young and such an angel. It is difficult to believe that he is related to this naughty devil. How can this child be so quick to bite other people? It's outrageous. Justin frowned as he glared down at the little boy, which shot daggers through Xander's heart. The man had relatively little contact with Xander during this period, so he didn't actually know what the boy was like. However, he knew that a child who had been brought up by Truman would undoubtedly be a little unorthodox. What stood out in particular was the time when the boy had first arrived at the Hunt Manor. When the bodyguard tried to take a sample of his DNA, the boy had bitten the bodyguard's finger and almost broken it. That incident certainly proved that his personality and way of handling stress were quite unpredictable. But when Justin interrogated Ruth, 
he realized that Ruth had abused the boy when he was still quite young. That must be how Xander had developed such a vicious and cruel personality, despite his young age. He narrowed his eyes and looked at Xander. Justin asked, Did you bite him? Xander's eyes widened. He stuck out his chin defiantly as he glared at Jack's mother and then looked back at Justin. The other boy's mother had defended her son right away when something went wrong. But what about his daddy tyrant? Would he do the same? Xander had his doubts and suddenly became furious. He couldn't stand being belittled. He clenched his jaw, lifted his chin, and nodded stubbornly. Yeah, I did. Therefore, after he spoke, he even grinned at Jack and said, Ha! You are already ten years old while I am only five, yet you can't beat me in a fight. That must be so embarrassing for you. And you even ran to your mummy because you couldn't beat me. How tough are you now? After being ridiculed, Jack felt even more aggrieved. He hugged his mother at once and burst into tears. His other cousins had never disobeyed him before, and he felt ashamed. Jack's mother's eyes reddened. You saw that, right, Justin? That boy is simply too arrogant, and his upbringing has been horrible. He shows no sign of remorse. Justin, you must do something about this. Please stand up for Jack. They are all children of the hunts. Even if this little monster is your son, and you are head of this family... He can't just bully other people and expect to get away with it. Justin narrowed his eyes and looked at Xander. He asked, What exactly is going on? He wasn't sure what had happened and he was determined to get to the bottom of it. Even if he didn't like the little boy very much, he didn't want to assume, based on his uneasy feelings about Xander, that the boy was in the wrong. That would not be fair but he was leery of asking this little boy whom he didn't really know. If it was the son he raised, Pete, he would have more confidence about the child's answers. He knew that son would explain everything clearly and truthfully, but he wasn't asking Pete. The child being accused was Xander. He knew the boy was sensitive with a huge chip on his shoulder. Without the love and care of a mother, he had grown up relying on himself. When he was met with trouble, all he knew was to shoulder the burden head on and fend for himself. Justin's question broke Xander's already shattered heart. He was deeply saddened to think that he didn't trust him. But then he brushed it off. Ha! What's the use of having a father if he doesn't believe in me? His gaze turned to ice. The little fellow scoffed and ignored Justin. Instead, he looked straight at Jack. Yeah, I bullied you. So? Weren't you asking for it? It's your ear this time, but next time, who knows? He shrugged his shoulders. Jack was so scared that he took a step back. Xander became even more smug after he saw Jack's reaction. However, the mother stepped in front of her son. She pointed at Xander, almost poking his chest. She shouted, You're really a wild child from God knows where. You have no manners whatsoever. Xander folded his little arms in front of his chest. When would I have learned manners? After all, I don't have a mother. Even though I have a father, he's pretty much non-existent too. He glanced at Justin before continuing. Without anyone to teach me, where am I supposed to get manners from? If you find me a troublemaker, then why don't you hit me? Do you dare to? I'm Justin's son, you know. If you have the guts, then just slap me across the cheek instead of prattling on and on over there. The child's attitude made Justin's expression darken. Xander's behaviour was completely arrogant and domineering. There was no trace of Pete's temperament in him at all. But he could tell that the little boy was overcompensating for some reason. Justin's expression became stern when he said, Xander... I'm going to give you one more chance. Tell me what exactly happened. What happened? Nothing much. It's just what you saw. I, your son, bullied someone. So what? Do you also want to hit me? Xander said stubbornly. What gives you the right to lecture me? 
I've only been in the house for a few days. What have you ever done to raise me? Justin clenched his jaw. He lowered his voice and inquired, Aren't you living in the Hunt Manor right now? This notion made Xander pull back slightly, and he became a bit more sensitive, but he still stared at Justin angrily. What Jack and the other children had said just now was still ringing in Xander's ears. Uncle Justin is holding the birthday party so that he can introduce Cherry to everyone. Who do you think you are? You are just an illegitimate son. Uncle Justin has never thought of acknowledging you as his son at all. As if that didn't make Xander feel bad enough, he considered, based on Justin's current attitude, that it must be true. Justin must be trying to drive him away. Xander clenched his fists and sneered. The only reason that I'm living in the Hunt Manor is because you begged my real father to send me here. Isn't that right? You didn't really want me here, did you? Xander rubbed his nose for emphasis and then crossed his arms in front of him again. Seeing how stubborn the child was behaving and how he simply refused to tell him anything, the domineering Justin slowly squatted down and met him eye to eye. He softened his voice and said as sincerely as he could, Xander, I hope you can talk to me if you ever face trouble. Don't learn from Truman. But before he could finish, Xander slapped him. Then he took a step back. Everyone in the room was shocked as Xander began to shout, You're telling me not to learn from him. My real father was the one who brought me up, so of course I will be like him. I was born a bad person. You really wish you could get rid of a son like me, right? Well, I don't want a father like you either. I never wanted to come back here at all. The only reason I am here is because you used Aunt Ruth to force me to come here. If you find me so annoying, why do you keep me around? Why don't you send me back? In my heart, the only father I will ever have is Truman Yale. After saying those extreme things, Xander stood in front of Justin defiantly. Justin fell silent. He just wanted to know how to communicate with Xander when he was behaving badly like he was now. He decided that he would take a different approach. He stood up and looked at Jack's mother. Jack's mother exclaimed, We all saw that, Justin. Having a child like him in this home is really what has made me so scared. If he can bite my son today, who knows what he may do tomorrow? Bite someone else or worse? We are not part of the main family, so I can tolerate it. We'll deal with it. But what if he bites paint? Justin frowned. Then the woman added with dramatic emphasis. And, oh my goodness, what if he bites cherry? This idea turned Justin's gaze icy cold. Fights among little boys were one thing. They are to be expected. But his daughter, that was a much larger concern. No one was going to hurt his sweet cherry. He stared deep into Xander's eye. No matter the reason, you are not allowed to bite anyone in the future. Xander looked at him angrily. <laughs> How can a dog's son not bite? Justin snapped. Xander, Yale. Xander stood there stubbornly, the expression on his little face all strained. Jack's mother sighed. Don't ask him about it anymore, Justin. I've already found out what happened. Jack came over to visit Pete and play with him, but Xander saw him. He rushed over immediately and said that he is also your son, so he also has the right to order them around. He wanted Jack to play with him, but Jack refused. And that's the reason why this little monster bit him. Justin narrowed his eyes. He stared at Xander and asked once more, is that what happened? He wanted to know the truth. The child was still young, so hopefully some habits could be corrected. He hoped that even though Truman had led the boy astray, Xander could be eased back onto the right path. But the little boy refused to answer. Jack's mother suddenly turned to look somewhere down the hall. At the sight of someone, she immediately said, 
Justin, even if you don't believe us, won't you believe Pete? Pete, quick, come here and tell your father what happened just now. Xander bullied Jack, right? Hearing this, Justin looked into the distance to see that Pete and Cherry had also heard the commotion and walked over. After they approached, Justin looked straight at Pete and asked, Is that what happened? He trusted Pete because he had brought him up. Jack's mother was relieved. Pete was very clever, and everyone understood the power of schemes and conspiracies very well. Besides, Jack had said that Pete wanted to drive Xander away. Wasn't this a great opportunity for him to do just that? Therefore, as long as Pete was not stupid, he would know what to say. By virtue of the incident, Jack would also be able to cling to Pete. When they were grown up, his life with the hunts in his corner would definitely improve. Jack's mother had calculated a beautiful future in her mind and looked at Pete expectantly. Jack's mother had not taken her child to the hospital to have his wound dressed right away in order to please Pete. For so many years, their family had been trying their best to turn Jack into Pete's right-hand man. Unfortunately, both Pete and Justin were indifferent to others flattering them. This was certainly true since Pete had mild autism, which meant that he didn't like to have anyone close to him, especially at the Hunt Manor. He didn't trust anyone. That was why Jack's mother saw this incident as an opportunity, despite her son's injury. She encouraged Pete to speak. Yes, Pete, tell your father what happened. Quick, you can explain to him how annoying that boy is. He often loses his temper and bullies others out of the blue for no reason. He's so domineering. He can be very savage and that's to say nothing of his lack of manners. You can convince your father to kick him out of the house. Or if your father doesn't want to do that, he should take Xander somewhere to get educated before he comes back here. Otherwise, when there are so many children in the house, who knows which child will be bitten next? Her hints were so obvious that Pete should have clearly understood, and yet Pete didn't speak. Jack's mother was stunned. Suddenly, she realized that perhaps Pete didn't want to be involved in this dispute. If word got around that it was Pete who had driven Xander away, his reputation could be badly affected. She narrowed her eyes at once, feeling that she had underestimated Pete. His skill at infighting within the household was quite developed, and he was making the choice to simply watch from the sidelines. But she wanted to express her loyalty to him and to his father, so Jack's mother spoke presumptuously once again. Oh my, I just remembered something. Pete had been busy when Jack came to visit him. Pete, did you even see them fighting? Once she asked a question that he could answer with certainty, Pete replied, I did. Jack's mother was taken aback when he spoke, but then she instantly became overjoyed, clapping her hands together. Well then, please hurry up and tell your father what happened. She couldn't believe that Pete was getting involved. This was exactly what she had been hoping for, and, therefore, she was ecstatic. From across the way, Xander sadly looked at Pete as he listened in on the exchange between Pete and Jack's mother. Pete stood there in a quandary. It was true he wanted nothing more than to drive this irritating little boy out of the house. Just like everyone had already said, no one in this family welcomed him. He was an extra. And this vocal woman and her children were undoubtedly filled with hostility towards Xander. Ha, <laughs> Xander thought to himself. Did they think that he wanted to be here? Xander lifted his chin and turned his head stubbornly to the side. Then he heard Pete state, It was indeed Xander who bit Jack's ear. Xander clenched his little fists and became even more disdainful. He snorted coldly. Yeah, I bit him. What about it? If you think you know so much, then why don't you? Before he could finish, Pete continued. But it was Jack who initially picked a fight. He called Xander an illegitimate child who didn't have a mother. 
He even said that Daddy doesn't want him and would throw him out. The group of them tried to beat Xander up. Xander only bit him in self-defense. As soon as Pete said that, everyone stood in silence, completely shocked. They stared incredulously at Pete. After giving a clear account of what had happened, Pete didn't speak anymore. Instead, he took a step back and exchanged a look with Cherry. Cherry had a big smile on her face, and she gave her brother a big thumbs up, which made Pete raise his eyebrows. The boy who used to be frosty and closed off in the past was now happy to exchange vivid and enthused looks with others, especially his twin sister. Jack's mother was dumbfounded. She stood where she was in a daze and looked at Pete in disbelief. She swallowed. Pete, do you know what you just said? Yes, I do, Pete said confidently. Although he did want to drive Xander away, it wasn't going to be through such despicable means. A tinge of anger flashed across Pete's eyes. Xander was Daddy's son. He only wanted to drive him away because he was worried that his existence would affect Mummy and her emotions. But this did not mean that outsiders could bully him. If Xander was up to no good, or if he made Mummy uncomfortable, then Pete would definitely not have been so soft-hearted. However, he wasn't about to lie in this instance. It was about doing what's right. Justin looked at his son with satisfaction. No matter the situation, Pete had never disappointed him. He would play little tricks on Xander every once in a while, but Pete was never ambiguous about his personal morals. The young boy always made the correct choice. Justin gently ruffled his son's hair. Then he looked at Jack's mother. With a sharp look in his eyes, he said, It seems like Gordon has been a little too busy lately. That must be why he hasn't been educating Jack properly. In that case, I'll let him come back and spend some quality time with his son. Although he wasn't a prized member of the company or family, Justin would still assign Gordon Hunt the occasional project so he could earn a bit of extra money. But now that these people were arrogant enough to call Xander his illegitimate child, he reconsidered this kindness. Instead, he decided that he didn't need to continue providing those jobs to this line of the Hunt family anymore. Justin could choose dislike and ignore his son. And in fact, he could even correct him. But other people were not allowed to do so. Who did they think they were? As soon as Justin mentioned bringing Gordon back, the blood drained from his wife's face. She stuttered, Justin, I, I, let me explain. Justin interrupted her. There's no need to explain. At this point, I only believe what Pete had to say. Then Justin glanced around and saw the butler. Since Jack misbehaves so much, he needs to learn obedience and consequences. For now, he is banned from attending classes at the Hunt's private school for a while. Yes, sir, the butler answered. Then, with a wave from Justin, security officers rushed in. They grabbed Jack and his mother immediately and took the two of them out. She was dumbfounded. All the children of the Hunts studied in the Hunts' private school in order to build their relationships with one another. After all, the powerful family became more powerful when they worked together. But if the people in the Far Branch's families moved too far away, who would remember them in the future? And now Justin had uttered a single phrase that would completely bar Jack from attending classes with his family members. This demonstrated to everyone that Justin's branch of the hunts intended to cut off that part of the family until further notice. Jack's mother howled and cried. She wanted to apologize and she wanted to speak, but Justin wouldn't give her the opportunity. The guards carried them out straight away. Xander stared blankly at everything happening in front of him. He was stunned. He hadn't expected Pete to speak up for him, nor had he expected the tyrant to deal with those problematic people so quickly. He remembered that once when he had argued with a kid in the past, Daddy Truman had told him that he had to find a way to deal with it himself. 
He suggested that if Xander beat them up and made them bleed, then they probably wouldn't dare to bully him anymore. It was only then that Xander had started attacking others as a line of self-defense. In the beginning, he only used his tiny little fists. But when he found that hitting didn't make the other party hurt or bleed enough, he started to bite. Biting made a true impact and stopped the bullying right away. Every time he bit someone and made them bleed, Truman would applaud and say, Good job, Xander. You keep that up. But now Justin was actually protecting Xander. Justin dealt with the kid who had bullied him, so Xander wouldn't have to be afraid any longer. Now it occurred to Xander that being in a family might not be such a bad thing after all. Just as his imagination began to run wild, Justin squatted down again and looked straight into his big dark eyes. He softly asked, Xander, were you here looking for me? Xander stared at the handsome man in front of him. He looked a little dazed, and his big dark eyes were filled with confusion and perplexity. He felt a tug at his heart. When this man squatted down to speak with Xander, he looked straight into his eyes. In the past, every time Daddy Truman spoke to him, he always looked at him from above, making Xander feel as if he were being ordered about. Xander had just discovered that the tyrant Justin was not like that. This man's behavior made him feel respected. Xander swallowed. He glanced at Pete again. Feeling a lump in his throat, he quietly stated, I came to tell you about my birthday. When Justin heard this, he nodded his head and asked, When is it? Xander was about to answer when his cell phone suddenly rang, interrupting him. Xander took out his cell phone, upon which he saw the word Daddy on the screen. It was Truman. He was a little surprised. When he answered the phone, Truman said, I heard someone bully Drew as the hunts. Xander turned and glanced at Justin. He grinned and said, I'll beat his ear off. Good job. Truman let out a deep chuckle and said, just as I expected and just the way I brought you up. His father's praise gave Xander a sense of accomplishment. As soon as he lifted his little chin, he heard Truman ask, How did Justin deal with the situation after you bit him? Xander looked at Justin. Then his big dark eyes swiveled around. As though he was avoiding the question, he briefly answered, What could he do? Then Xander shrugged his shoulders and added, Daddy, the food here is pretty nice. When Truman heard this, he fell silent for a moment. Then he smiled and said, If it tastes good, then you can stay there a few more days. Xander nodded. Okay. He had made an agreement with Truman before he came. They had agreed that for the sake of his rabbits, cats and dogs, he would only stay in the United States for a maximum of 10 days. When he first arrived, he had felt very unhappy staying with the hunts. But now, just a moment ago, he suddenly felt that it would be nice to stay here longer. As soon as he thought that, he heard Truman say, Oh, pass the phone to your father. I want to tell him something to make sure he takes good care of you. Although Xander felt that it wasn't appropriate to do that, he had never gone against Truman's orders. So he looked at Justin and said, Here. Justin had been watching him on the phone with Truman the entire time. In the basement encounter, Justin remembered hearing about the ways Ruth had mistreated the boy. This made him question how Truman treated the child as well. Judging from the way Xander spoke on the phone, it seemed that his relationship with Truman was pretty good. Xander was smart. That was why he was able to bully Ruth. Justin's impression was that the boy and Truman got along, and, at the very least, it appeared that Truman most likely did not abuse him. That discovery made Justin feel a little more comfortable. 
He answered the phone, but because he didn't want the children to hear their conversation, he walked to the side and answered softly. Hello? Mr. Hunt, my sister is dead. There was some faint amusement in Truman's voice when he said that, as though he had never once cared whether Ruth lived or died. Justin lowered his eyes. Oh, she left the country after I released her. Whatever happened next had nothing to do with me. Needless to say, Ruth had been killed by someone he sent. Justin believed child abusers like her shouldn't be allowed to stay alive in the world. She also caused far too much trouble for Justin as well as Nora. Justin knew himself. He was not a kind soul. Growing up in the vicious Hunt family and running a huge conglomerate had taught him to be merciless. Truman chuckled and said, I am not calling to hold you accountable. Rather, I wanted to tell you that she had never treated Zander well. I've wanted to deal with her for a very long time. It's just a pity that the Yale's family beliefs don't allow us to do anything to our family members. Early on in their communication, Justin had gathered that Truman didn't much care for Ruth. Even so, Justin didn't expect Truman to find his own sister so... disposable. From what Truman had just communicated, it appeared as if he had been simply using Justin to deal with Ruth. Whatever his scheme had been, it didn't matter now. Justin had no regrets regarding his actions toward Ruth. Had he known earlier that this was Truman's plan all along, he might have resented the thought of Truman taking advantage of him. But now, even though Justin was keeping himself from getting too close to Xander until the DNA test results came in, he knew the things Ruth did to Xander were unforgivable. In his mind, his violent choices were justified. Justin lowered his eyes. Why are you calling me? Truman laughed. I heard that you're hosting a birthday party for Cherry and Pete. If that's the case, why wouldn't you celebrate their birthdays with Sanders? Justin narrowed his eyes. What do you mean? Truman laughed again. It means that. Zander asked me about his birthday just now, and I told him it's September 8th. If you don't include him in the birthday celebrations on that day, how do you think that he would feel? Justin instead asked, When exactly is his birthday? Make a guess? Justin clenched his fists. Truman laughed again. I really look forward to it. If you had to choose between Peter Hunt and Xander, who would you choose? Justin suddenly asked, Is Xander's mother Nora or not? Truman smacked his lips. Rather than give a clear answer, Truman's words perplexed Justin even more. You might say that she is, but you also might say she's not. But why would you believe anything I say? If I say that she is, then my motive may be to get you and Nora to treat him well. But I might actually be lying in order to have him beat out Pete and become the heir to the Hunt's assets. If I say she's not his mother and she is... Maybe he actually is her son, and my objective is nothing more than to make you treat one child better than the other. Maybe I want to make the brothers turn against each other. Mr. Hunt, I heard that you are your father's only son, and that you were selected as the heir to the family when you were just a child. Perhaps you'll have to choose a successor soon. Xander and Pete both have high IQs. Between the two, who would you choose? Truman chuckled after he said that. I have nothing more to say. Whether you want to include Xander to their birthday party or not, it's up to you. With that, Truman hung up. Justin stared at the phone with a frown. Truman's call had totally disrupted his plans. He looked at Xander, only to see that the boy, who had been very distant up until now, was looking up at him. The colors of his eyes were clearly defined, and he looked very cute and innocent. He raised his head proudly and said, 
To answer your question, I was indeed looking for you. I am here to tell you that my birthday is also on September 8th. After Nora left the hunts, she did not go home. She was on a mission of her own. She went straight to the hospital and performed acupuncture on Charles, determined to bring him back. And half an hour later, a groggy Charles finally woke up. <laughs> 